Hello, everybody. It is great to be here one more time today. My name is Gary Fowler, and I'm the CEO, president, and co-founder of GSD Get You Done Venture Studios, a premier AI and quantum venture studio located in the heart, yes, the heart of Silicon Valley. In fact, today I'm looking at those mountains right up towards uh, Palo Alto. Love artificial intelligence, quantum computing. I've been involved in 17 startup and several unicorns. I was on the original management team at Click Software, which was sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion. And also Eva.ai, an AI HR tech company that co-founded with Dr. David Yang. We believe that intellectual capacity is evenly spread around the world and opportunities are not. We also believe that we may to make a difference on this planet to be able to help all of us live longer, live better lives, live quality lives by making taking care of this environment and doing a lot of things with our circular economy. With that, I'd like to introduce Jay Potter as my guest from Ecor. We're going to talk about what's happening with his incredible company, his entrepreneurial background, and how we can make this world a bit better. Hey, Jay, how you doing today? Thanks, Gary. I'm great. So tell me a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. I know before the show aired, we were talking a little bit about it. You're in San Diego. You're originally from Santa Barbara. What made you decide to stay out in California? Uh, well, uh, the women and the weather. Oh, there you go. <laughs> That's so. It, do you like it? What, how's the, what's the quality of life like in San Diego? Well, I, my one of my buddies from New Jersey was the one I was talking about. Was just out here for ten days, and uh, I think he spent the last ten days. Um, uh, rooting around seeing how he was going to be able to move back. Uh, obviously, we get all of about nine inches of rain a year if we're lucky. Uh, right now, obviously, we haven't, um, uh, which means a lot of sunshine, which means uh, any, day, any day you want can be a play day. Uh, not, that I, not that I get that opportunity, but it's there for me when uh, one day. And so what do you like to do for fun in San Diego? So what is fun? Do you go surfing? Do you go down to Mexico? I mean, what no, do you sur do surfing, surfing is, uh, is a yesteryear uh, uh, adventure. Uh, Mexico, if you guys haven't read, is a disaster right now. So no one's going to Mexico. Um, I, uh, for me, it's uh, certainly hit the beach, but really it's uh, my, my one passion every week is to try to learn how to play golf uh, from, uh, from, from the beginning every single week. That's the that's for me is the adventure that and playing with the kids. And do you go do you go over to uh, Palm Springs at all? Do you play golf over there? We've got a couple of timeshares over there, so yes. And then in the in the winter, we'll we'll spend a couple of weekends uh, uh, running around there. It's absolutely gorgeous at that time of the year. If you've never been out in uh, in in uh, the desert, uh, especially Palm Springs in uh, in the in the late winter, early early spring, it's it's incredible. Yeah, no, I know. You know, last time I was down there, we took this, um, this, um, um, I don't know what it is. It's a, like an elevated train. It goes up in the, up on top of a yeah. mountain there. I don't know what it, I forget the name of it. There's a name for that kind of a contraption, but I'll tell you what, it was unbelievable. It, we, you know, went from blistering hot to this kind of like paradise on top, although there were a lot of snakes <laughs> and you weren't supposed to, you got to be very careful walking around because the snakes apparently enjoyed up there too. But what a amazing view of uh, Palm Springs in that area. It's just amazing. Now there are parts that there's times of the year where it'll be 80 degrees uh, and sunny down below and be snowing up top. Wow. And you know, the, I saw a sign out there. It said, be careful of these uh, sheep, like these rams. Is that true? Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. really there? They'll defend their turf. You bet. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. And I saw a Roadrunner. You know, the only thing I had seen in the uh, in the uh, comics or cartoons, and I saw a Roadrunner the first time. It was uh, really interesting, actually, running along the road. Yeah, I've even I've even seen a bald eagle swoop down and uh, pick up a uh, uh, Roadrunner. Wow. Yeah, a lot of life. A lot of life out there. And how, you know, so the quality of life down in San Diego, so not bad. A lot of celebrities running around, right? It seems like I know when I was down in San Diego and then up to uh, L.A., a lot of uh, pretty famous people running around, just like casual. Mm. Yeah, that, that and their entourage. And their entourage. Wow, amazing. So what made you decide? So you're a serial entrepreneur. Tell me a little bit about, you know, your journey in terms of Envision Solar and you know, how do you come up with these ideas and, you know, how do you make them successful? 
Um, well, it, it's uh, I took a turn in uh, in right around 2000 uh, from a from a successful oil and gas uh, um, career. Uh, my wife still reminds me of that because uh, money was flowing. Um, and but it's the epitome of uh, of uh, of why we need to have sustainable efforts, because uh, you know, one of the things that, I, that we encountered was everybody asking, why is their check smaller in oil and gas? And you explained to them, it's because for every barrel you produce, there's one less there for you to get. And every, one co- every barrel costs more than the next. Um, it is the epitome of sustainability or the reason for it. Uh, and that drove me into, 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 into a different uh, uh, career path uh, into sustainability. So it's, it's been a 20 year uh, plus journey uh, that has uh, has seen the uh, development of uh, more than a half a dozen first ever technologies that um, are all playing a factor uh, today. Not all the companies were successful, but uh, the base technologies that we were in uh, were you know first to market. It's very difficult, as as I know you know, Gary, to to uh, be able to launch those companies and maintain that kind of leadership. Uh, through the process. Often, oftentimes you're just creating a good path for the guy that follows you. Yeah, no, I agree with you. You know, and the thing is, you know, you're right about it, Jay. The, you know, and I, I had the uh, lead author of the Nobel Prize for 2007, the one that uh, Gore won, but the other part of the group that helped write it. And uh, we were talking about the environment and, you know, you're, you're right. We got to like, first of all, you're, <laughs> we're going to run out of oil. It, it isn't if it's when. And then the other thing is what happens in the Northeast of the United States, what happens in Minnesota, what happens in Alaska when there's no more oil and there aren't enough trees to burn to be able to, I mean, so this isn't like we have any options. We better start working on it now. Look at this crisis that we have now in Europe, right? And this is just because of the Russians cutting off the oil and gas supply. I mean, this, this has really spurned us forward. And, you know, the good news is, Jay, I'm hopeful because here we are with these electric cars. You know, 10 years ago, people were laughing at Elon Musk. Now look at it, right? What, 25% of the cars, of the new car sales in Northern California are electric cars, right? Or, so the good news is we're moving in the right direction. But so tell me a little bit about it. So you did Envision. What was your, why did you do Envision? I mean, how, did you wake up one day and say, oh, solar is better than oil? No, again, it's it's like so many things. It's it, there are opportune moments, right? And so it's all about meeting people and networking and and allowing uh, everybody to kind of share their ideas. And we were at a cocktail party, probably three drinks in, uh, and uh, a executive of Kyocera uh, mentioned, uh, and Kyocera, for those that don't know, is who is and was a, a, a major producer of uh, a very high end uh, solar panels. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. I see them for other things. I mean, they're a huge conglomerate then. Right? They're, they got they got everything. So they have a major facility here in San Diego, uh, which I believe is their is their is their U.S. headquarters. Uh, and uh, they had a big ass parking lot next to their building. And my architect partner um, basically uh, and I were laughing and that the building that the, the property the building sits on isn't worth any more than the property the parking lot sits on. And all they did with parking lots uh, anywhere globally is to paint lines on it and maybe plant a couple of trees. Mm-hmm. And so and we were just, again, it came from a joke. And we basically were laughing, saying, God, why don't we do something, you know, we could do something accretive to a parking lot. What can we do? And, you know, uh, the Kyocera guy mentioned, he says, why don't we, he says, why don't we, uh, how, how, what about putting solar up uh, up above it? And we said, well, like a solar canopy. And they said, all right, well, why not? I mean, they make those today. And so we came up with uh, our own very attractive uh, version of that. So we built the first one with Kyocera, with Kyocera dollars uh, in 2005. Wow. Long time ago. Yeah. So we were the first ones to, first ones, as far as we know, to build a solar covered parking array. Uh, and uh, we said, well, I mean, that's looked like a pretty good business. Uh, we were quite naive, obviously, at the time as to as to the aggression we would encounter uh, from the, uh, 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 you know, uh, general contractors out there who basically after we installed, I think, 100 of them 
uh, throughout the uh, Southwest and even into uh, even to some major headquarters, I think, uh, for Johnson & Johnson in Pennsylvania and, and a number of other high-profile uh, locations. Um, suddenly, everybody was copying us and uh, uh, raced to the bottom. And they weren't they weren't doing it with the same they weren't doing it with the same attention to uh, to an, an attractive uh, um, accretive uh, architectural feature. Mm -hmm. In other words, we we felt that it had to be something that truly was visually accretive. Unfortunately, uh, uh, and this is part of the problem, Gary, is that energy and its value never took into consideration structure. It was simply a cost per watt. Mm -hmm. So if you're building an accretive and attractive structure, it's going to cost more than just a simple iron shoved, uh, you know, drilled into the ground. Um, you know, that's where the market went. The market went based upon, and the same thing that grew the oil and gas industry, it went based on the demand, A, for the product, but B, more importantly, for the tax considerations. Mm -hmm. so tax considerations drove the entire market uh, into whatever the lowest cost structure you can put in. And then what, what, what's appeared is I'm sure everyone has seen, uh, you end up with a lot of rather shanty like structures in parking lots, which with all the poles and columns, and I mean, it's, it's, it's not attractive. We were building, uh, uh, and people could go see them. We were building very attractive uh, architectural and mechanical features that would have, uh, uh, you know, on a single trunk, and we called them solar trees, which we trademarked, and that ended up uh, becoming a, a, a solar tree became a public domain because it was used so often. We'd have a single structure on a, on a, on a 1,500 square foot solar canopy that, wow. would, that, would, that would track the sun. So, yeah, we took that and we ended up having to pivot in 2010. Uh, and, uh, and I really pushed... Uh, for at that time, that was very early on in, in uh, certainly Elon Musk's effort. Uh, and I had a chance to, uh, to drive one of those early uh, uh, models and I was sold. I knew right then and there that the electric car was going to defeat the internal combustion engine simply on efficiency. Mm -hmm. So we, we pivoted that company into a, a solar powered electric vehicle charging platform, which is, uh, which is today... I'm uh, uh, happy to say the one and only and uh, doing very well. No, that's great. Are you still actively involved with the company? No, I had to. Uh, I had to. I found the right guy to run the company, Desmond Wheatley, who's just amazing. Um, uh, so I found the perfect guy to run it. And uh, I, I stepped off the board uh, before its big public move uh, in order to keep all my concentration on, on my on my baby. My real, my my big focus, uh, envision was important, but a sideline in comparison to to where my attention was. And how is it when you do that? You have somebody come in and run your company. Is it hard to let go? Uh, it's hard for some people to let go. It's not hard for me because uh, I, I I I've always been good at recognizing leverage, uh, and that is you can't be in two places at the same time, um, and. Uh, what is that old adage that I used to use? And so many, so many founders would fail when I would ask them, is 10% of something worth more than 100% of nothing? And they would look at me and go, well, what do you mean? And that's when I knew that guy doesn't, did not understand uh, the power of sharing. Yeah, no, sharing is important. You got to do that. That's you know part of the way to build a company, right? It's, and most people don't get it. You got to treat people fairly and and do the right thing and, and find the right kind of talent and, you know, gives you a peace of mind having somebody running the company. And, and uh, is it public now, Jay? Is it a public company? Yeah, it's under a new name called Beam Global and the symbol's B double -E E-M. So Beam, like Beam Me Up Scotty, mm -hmm. uh, is the name Beam Global. And uh, uh, they've now acquired a battery company in, um, uh, in Chicago, outside of Chicago. Uh, so they've been able to uh, uh, protect themselves from many of the inflationary elements without having to change their price and maintain margin. That's great. And how does it feel going back to the company? Do you, do you look at it as your baby when you go back? Is it still your baby? Absolutely. My, even my, uh, 
my kids sadly point out even the ones that we didn't build is saying, Hey, there's the, there's the thing that daddy built. Right. So mm -hmm. that's always, that's always a feel good. Uh, the company today is, um, far different than the one obviously that we, uh, that we birthed, uh, which is also something to be very proud of, but also, uh, from a pragmatic perspective, again, and more evidence that, that bring that, that, that the guys that, that help you start a company, versus the ones that scale it are very different uh, 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 people. No, I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I remember a meeting with Bob Dorf and Bob Dorf and I would talk, he wrote the book, The Owner's Startup Manual, and we were talking about it because once you hit 150 employees, things change. You know, you, become, you go from being an entrepreneur to being an operator, right? And having to manage the, I, you know, I remember for me is that when we got to a point where people would say, we would have a meeting about a meeting. It was time for me to go, you know, because it wasn't so interesting anymore. Meetings about meetings. It just like, and the politics of that, the meetings about meetings. Was well, the hard, the hard part is the people and the management of, of the people, keeping everybody focused and everybody, you know, kind of rowing in the same direction. That's a skill set that, that uh, uh, is rare. Um, and it's, and it's one I'm, 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 uh, I work on every day. Um, just simply because, you know, these days you have people spending as much time analyzing labor laws is, is, uh, in, in place of, of, uh, of building their own craft and being better. Um, it makes it, it makes it more challenging. I mean, we're going to, we also, along with all the challenges that come with climate, uh, we have to deal with all the social challenges as well. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's, you know, there are a lot of things, listen, you know, the planet earth, I mean, and most people don't realize in Africa, there are 1.4 billion people in 54 countries, you know, the largest population are the 30 in the world. We've got all these challenges with, you know, trying to feed everybody, uh, you know, by 2050, you got to double the food supply to feed everybody. And oh, by the way, we can't increase the number of cows. So with that point, tell us a little bit about what you're working on today in ECOR and how you're going to change the world. Well, and, and just on your last point, Grantham actually made the best statement I've seen to date. He said, we've picked all the low hanging fruit. We found all the cheap oil, cheap water, cheap, you know, cheap trees, cheap zinc, cheap lithium. Now we got to climb the tree and, and that uh, that requires a, a different skill set. And we better be we better be very diligent about how we do it. Uh, and, and I think that's a that's a great segue to uh, Ecor Global, uh, which is 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 my baby. This is a uh, now 14 pushing 15 year overnight success. A uh, lot of energy. So when I when I left the oil and gas industry, I started uh, for all for no reason I can remember. I started reading about I was reading an article in a white paper on uh, on waste and the numbers uh, involved in waste and then the components of waste. And it, 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 it's one of those things where you start to realize you can't even comprehend the vastness of uh, of, of what's going on. Uh, but like today, you know, they're spending a lot of time and money measuring microbes and bacteria and even and even for COVID in the waste stream, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're able to identify and it tells a lot. So when you look at our waste stream, the municipal solid waste stream uh, and what it contains, it's staggering. So mm -hmm. uh, just for your viewers benefit, just very briefly, 70% of everything in the waste stream is cellulose based. Wow. And 70% of that is one time use. Wow. That's incredible. And you know, how do we change the world? And we can't do this anymore, Jay. We can't go down through. We're, we're destroying our planet. You no, know? But it, again, it's, it's become very, it's become very binary uh, for me. And we all know what has to happen. The hard part is actually doing it and doing it in an economic uh, fashion in order to in order to and be so dramatic in that economics that 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 the fear of change which is what holds everything back uh becomes you know like the scales of justice right so as the value and economics of of what has to be done and what is the right thing to do becomes so dramatically larger i'm gonna get my hands right here mm -hmm. so dramatically larger than the than the than than the fear and or the cost of abandonment um, uh, 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 become so obvious. And if it just uh, from my perspective, like I said, it's become very binary. 
we just simply have to eradicate uh, petrochemicals and the oil and gas industry. And I know that some people go, oh, that's, that's preposterous. It doesn't have to happen immediately, but over the next 30 years, we have to find a way to keep driving that, uh, the use of that down uh, and the replacements up. And so what, what, what we do uh, is, is really, quite, um, uh, really quite simple. We are able to take, uh, we're able to take that cellulose waste um, and we're able to make a board out of it. And a board is something that most people take very, very much for granted. So this board or a board like this today is MDF, HDF, particle board, or plywood. Those would be the, those would be the animals that make up our whole world. So the soffit uh, here behind me uh, is framed in, uh, in uh, particle board or plywood. Uh, the couch behind you, its entire structure is probably particle board or plywood. The the uh, the nice cabinets in the in the background there uh, behind you uh, are made of MDF, and all of those products are are about you know twenty five to thirty percent petrochemicals. So not only are they unhealthy for us and they're off gassing, uh, they have no future. They can only go into a landfill or incineration. And that, that right there is where it must stop. We can't do that. Uh, we, have to, we, we, we have to come up with an alternative. And this, and this is one of those alternatives. So we can make this um, uh, to replace and, and meet the performance specs for all those things I just identified. We can meet those performance specs with a material that has a life, it has a residual value, it lives on and it stores carbon. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then here's the here's the killer part. It doesn't cost any more than what they're using today. Now, could that be used like for tiles? That looks like that could be used for tiles for a floor. Well, you would use it for flooring as part of a flooring substrate. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we, we have a tendency to like, a tr uh, we want very attractive wood looking like flooring. So you've seen a lot of that in, in luxury vinyl tile where it looks identical to flooring, but underneath that thin layer, whether it's wood or vinyl, yep. and printed vinyl is underneath that is a structure of particle board or plywood. Wow. That's amazing. And so how big is this market? Trillions. As far as the markets that it that it participates in, the industry it's the industry the wood panel industry itself is in the hundreds of billions, um, uh, and and global. Uh, the thing that we're doing as one of the forebears of uh, of uh, the circular economy, which we've we've been in since the word came, you know since the word was invented in in uh, practically in in ninety eight by by Bill McDonough. Um, yeah, this is what it's all about, which is the decentralization of manufacturing. So, you know, you in Silicon Valley, there's lots of building, just like here in San Diego and in New York and everywhere else, there's lots of construction going on. That construction means they're importing all those materials that they're building with. And a good chunk, a, a big subset of the materials they use are, of course, are plywood, particle board, and MDF. And instead of importing those those products they can be built and made uh, in in a in a gen, in that same general location. So it's the decentralization of manufacturing, elimination of logistics. Um, so then it becomes a a big supply chain solution as well. Wow. So we should be taking all of the recycling that we're doing instead of leaving it for scavengers. We should be very diligent on what we collect and converting those materials. Uh, into uh, usable products, high value products. So, you know, the, a, a, a ton of, of cardboard right now is worth somewhere about 130 to, depending on location and quality, $100, $100 to $150 a ton. In our process, we can convert it for less than five or $600 a ton. And it's just a simple substrate uh, is worth more than 12 and $1,500 a ton. So yeah. there's an economic value proposition that cannot be ignored. 
So why wouldn't one people want to do it then, Jay? If there's that much value in this, why why wouldn't they everybody be on board with this thing? Well, uh, you know, there there right therein lies the big tough question that goes back to fear of change, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you take your buyer, um, and let's not talk. Let's just talk about a regular Joe. You know, a contractor. He has a relationship with Bob down the street, who he buys all of his lumber and and uh, and his panels from. Uh, he's bought it from the guy for 25 years. He knows exactly what he gets. He knows exactly what it costs, much more now than it was several years ago. But he knows what he knows, and he's not taking any chances, um, taking no risk. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So we've had to go through the trauma uh, for several years in proving the performance characteristics of this material under duress. Uh, with a number of major global players in order to overcome that obje that 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 um, that objection, that fear. Um, and so we're just now at that stage where we've now won over a number of very large companies that now want to uh, contract the delivery of that material from facilities built uh, very near or in some cases on top of their existing manufacturing and or assembly operations. No, that's great. And how's business? Uh, it's getting very exciting. So uh, the last piece of all the dominoes that have to line up, uh, sadly, the one that's slower than everyone else is the financial community uh, because they, they too are very risk adverse, mm -hmm. right? They, they, they unfortunately only move quickly uh, when there's uh, when there's a, uh, uh, a, a quick risk based return. So like the meme stocks, I mean, there's no reason for GameStop to be treating GameStop to be treating in billions of dollars. It's an antiquated business model that has no future yet. Here we are, right? Uh, there's a lot of AI plays that have that, that are, were passed up years ago that are still finding avenues to secure hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, that that I believe will be will be nothing but uh, a line item of loss uh, in the in the years to come. Investing in something like manufacturing, which is what we are, uh, that seems a little old school uh, for people. They like software. They like uh, they like quick. Uh, so we have to overcome that as well, which we're which we're doing a, a real good job, and and we're we're finally engaged in in some powerful. Uh, conversations that paint a very bright future for us, but we're still every day fighting, scratching, and clawing uh, for us to be able to maintain uh, uh, the growth curve uh, that we set out in front of us. So we've built one facility during COVID. We just are now finishing a second facility uh, in uh, both of them in Europe, and we're putting the uh, we're putting the uh, uh, cash together with the big banks uh, for the building of another dozen plus facilities, uh, both in Europe and here. Uh, but it doesn't appear to be any end in sight. We're having every day to turn down, uh, you know, five to 10 legitimate big company engagements uh, that want to go down this path. They're sold on the circular economy. They've made the intellectual decision to go down this path. Uh, which is great. So there's a sign of a positive future for you, Gary. Uh, the circular economy, unlike sustainability, has sunk in. It's gotten to the marrow. Uh, right. Sustainability was too amorphic. It, it could take any shape. It's subject to greenwashing. Circular economy is not. You either do or you don't. It is, it is Yoda. <laughs> yeah. No, I got it. So, hey, listen, we're coming up to the top of the show, Jay. So, Closing thoughts and how do people get a hold of you? Uh, please, if uh, if you believe in if you believe in in our future, uh, which is about sustain real sustainability, the circular economy, uh, Ecor Global is the company's name. I'm Jay Potter. I've been here since day one. I, I'm uh, I'm actively searching for my replacement in the next couple of years um, uh, for somebody that uh, is about at least ten years younger and has the energy I had ten years ago. Uh, I, I can be reached at jpotter at ecorglobal.com, J-A-Y-P-O-T-T-E-R, um, 
I this is going to be exciting. We're at the we're at the forefront of something very big. No, it sounds great. Jay, I want to thank you so much for taking time here at a busy, busy schedule to join my show today. And to my audience out there, thanks for joining one more time of GSD Presents Silicon Valley AI and Tech. And my name is Gary Fowler. I'm your host. Stay tuned for another exciting edition from Silicon Valley on Thursday. Stay happy, stay safe, and stay healthy. Tune in again. We'll see you soon. Thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Gary. Without you, these things wouldn't be possible. Uh, it's just people like you that have these incredible ideas and have done these incredible things that make uh, our world turn. So thanks, thank buddy. you. You bet. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care of yourselves.